Champagne socialism is a term used to describe those who claim to be in favor of helping the poor when really they just hate the rich. Today, we have an epidemic of rosé activism. Those who claim to support people of color when really they just hate white men. In doing what they believe is right for people of color, on a deeper level, they are keeping them in a state of victimhood and vulnerability to maintain a sense of purpose as a savior. This would be called emotional abuse in a romantic partnership, and it's no different in a larger context. In this video, I'll draw on the components of transactional analysis to show how activists, people of color, and white men or society at large are in a savior, victim, persecutor triangle. And unless there's a fundamental change, this trend will continue denying people of color the ability to define themselves as individuals, keeping them shackled to a collective mentality of victimhood and oppression. Chapter 1. What this video is not. If you've made it this far, there are a few disclaimers necessary in broaching a topic like this. Number 1. This video is not some right-wing propaganda. In fact, I believe that due to unchecked capitalism and liberation from all social structures, we have been starved of deeper meaning and communal ties. Thus, for many, rosé activism becomes a proxy for the healthy romantic and family relationships they yearn for or the children they never had. Number 2. This video in no way, shape or form denies the horrors of history, nor does it deny the legacy that history has left. Many racial inequities in the West have been influenced by racism. Statistically speaking, hardly anyone denies that. The issue stems from those who seek to critique or question today's rosé activism being unfairly smeared as denying history. Let me make it clear, much of history, even recent history, is shameful and deplorable. However, that shame, empathy and desire to right the wrongs of the past is being weaponized and gatekept to push a Trojan horse replete with cynical and harmful ideologies. Chapter 2. What is the victim-savior relationship? Games People Play by Eric Byrne details the way humans step in and out of various ego states through their interpersonal relationships, those states being child, parent, adult. A healthy social transaction would be two people conversing as adults, and these interactions, or social intercourse as he calls it, go awry when one or more participants are in the child or parent ego state. While in these states, we revert to social scripts that we play out, often reminiscent of dynamics we experience through our formative years. Byrne lists some of these common scripts as games. Stephen Karpman built on Byrne's ideas to develop his theory of the drama triangle involving a victim, a savior, and a persecutor. An example of this may be a single mother who coddles and protects her son inadvertently enabling his poor behavior so she can feel a sense of control and purpose in caring for him. Basically an extreme version of a mama's boy and we all know a mother and son like that. Maybe the father was in fact abusive and thus he becomes the villain or persecutor and the mother, desperate to ensure her son ends up nothing like his father, creates a whole new Frankenstein monster in a capricious, needy, emotionally unintelligent victim. Authors Barry and Janae Weinhold note that developmental trauma in infants or babies can cause people to split the world into good and bad and move through life with a hero-villain mindset, unable to see nuance in situations or people. And if you don't develop a firm and secure sense of individual identity, you play out codependent games through your adulthood in order to get your needs met. In a subtle social tantrum, you personalize everything that is said or done to you in order to extract sympathy from those who are playing out a savior role. The Weinholds even note how some victims unconsciously seek out suffering as though it is some kind of precious gift. Now, there are times in our life where we've all been the victim. We may have exaggerated it in order to test how much a partner loves us. Similarly, many of us have likely been the savior. We've wanted to help people, but implicitly wanted to feel heroic and saintly in the process. It becomes an issue when the victim never makes an effort to change or when the savior enables poor behavior. If you keep treating someone like a victim, they get accustomed to the sympathy and it mimics a drug. The analogy in Weinhold's work is a vending machine. If you get a bottle of Coke every day and one day put your money in and none comes out, you get angry. Some people would abuse the Coke machine. That's exactly how those steeped in a victim mindset act. When their identity as a victim is challenged, 
When they're not afforded the anticipated level of empathy, it angers them. They throw a social tantrum, the savior blames the villain and feels a need to comfort them, keeping each party in a parent-child dynamic. These interpersonal dynamics can be applied to intercultural and interpolitical dynamics, where various groups in a complex society are in a relationship, and thus similar roles can play out. Much like the overbearing parent who uses their child as a means to extract a sense of purpose and identity, Rosé activists use people of colour or other marginalised groups to gain a similar sense of identity and purpose. Those people of colour, enmeshed with a victim mindset, react much like they who don't get their coke when their identity of victim is challenged or their narrative of ubiquitous racism is questioned. I believe secular people of colour are notably susceptible to this. Many of us had overbearing, extremely strict mothers. Many didn't even have a father present and rosé activism fills the void left by inadequate social development in our corporate world. Similarly, in an increasingly atomized and secular society, women are more removed from their natural instincts and much like how a dearth of positive masculinity manifests in Andrew Tate and Red Pill, dwindling opportunities for the majority of women to integrate their natural maternalism into a way of being manifests in hypermaternal rosé activism. Chapter 3. Why is it dangerous? You might be thinking, Neil, why is this a bad thing? As you said previously, racism has left a legacy. Do people of colour not need care and compassion? Are they not actual victims? Well, where my views bifurcate from popular right-wing opinion is that I do believe a degree of rosé activism or performative social justice is fine. It may even be good for society. If I experienced an actual instance of racism or was made to feel othered because of my race, which does happen and should be validated, it would be nice to know that the online masses would extend their support to me. It becomes dangerous when that support comes with a cult-like ideology wherein to show that support, one has to dismantle the entire system when it's not even clear what that system itself is. The ideology that comes with the support need not be banned, but it needs to be treated for what it is an ideology, or else like any unchecked cult, it becomes dangerous. It's one interpretation of the world, not the sacred gospel by which we must restructure society. Critical race theory can be an effective way to broaden our understanding of racism. It should be a voice at the table, concerned with how society at large, all the way down to its language, influences the experience of various groups. But it has become the sacred voice, unquestionable and pervasive. Even in the name itself, it is a theory and should be treated as such. For reasons mentioned earlier, those who seem to be the most socially unhinged and developmentally scarred are attracted to it. Thus it becomes dangerous as an avenue for individuals to do what they likely should be doing with a therapist. John McWhorter's excellent work, Woke Racism, details the myriad ways this creed has become a new religion. The language is imprecise, there's a deep spiritual component, arguably an evolution of the Christian ethic in its guilt-based care for the downtrodden, with its version of original sin being whiteness or maleness. Personally, I find it easier to have a reasonable conversation with a fervent Christian than I do with the people often described as woke. McWhorter aptly and hilariously calls them medievals with lattes. Rosé activists tend to be disproportionately female, white, young, and upper class. Now, this group is usually the most cognizant of emotional malfeasance in romantic relationships. I mean, go on TikTok and everything can be construed as manipulation or a red flag of some sort. Yet they are blissfully ignorant of how their actions can be at best performative and cringeworthy, at worst downright malevolent. Look, everyone knows a man who has never interacted with women, has a set of theories about them, or overcompensates by becoming a hyper-progressive male feminist pick-me. And there are clear parallels with people who just may have been brought up in white enclaves of Western society. Maybe they feel guilty about that, or are hiding a deep discomfort towards people of colour, and therefore have no idea how to be normal amongst them, overcompensating by being overtly performative and self-hating. I mean, when I was 19, a girl and I had a few drinks and she started crying, apologizing to me for being white. In the truest sense of a 19 year old, I was just trying to hit. I didn't want any of this crap. This is an extreme instance, but as a person of color, this doesn't make me feel good. This is clearly just about her. There's also a broader trend where a duty to perform moral action is being replaced by simply saying or tweeting moral things, which is obviously dangerous. 
we all tend to think of those on the left as the compassionate side and the right as the strict rules-based side. However, the book Who Really Cares, written by Arthur C. Brooks, was expecting to find that American liberals were the most charitable, in fact found the complete opposite, that at every level of income, conservatives, even secular conservatives, were more charitable in financial donations and in actions such as returning someone's lost keys. Yes, this was written in the mid-2000s, so it may have changed, but these stereotypes have persisted far longer. He made a point that stuck with me, noting how if moral outrage is only a substitute for private charity, the needy will become worse off than before. In essence, rosé activists are more interested in being the most pure, and there is an element of this activism that involves outsourcing their morality to society at large, usually the government. When you're middle class tweeting about how evil corporations are and that the government doesn't care about homeless people, it's a form of fast food virtue. You get the feeling of being good without doing good and thus you're less incentivized to actually give money to the homeless or other charities. I'm not trying to claim I'm some sort of saint, nor am I trying to make an argument for conservatism the government should play a role in social issues. All I'm saying, in the simplest terms possible, is that when you say the right things, it can make you less likely to actually do the right things. In 2020, the global response to George Floyd was so pronounced that even here in Australia, my Instagram feed went entirely black followed soon by filtered Polaroids of Rosé activists at what seemed to be a large-scale high school drama performance. Now, it was a traumatic video to watch, and this was how society processed it. But the narrative and the ideology that came with it was dangerous. How often is it that people of colour are herded onto primetime pop politics shows poignantly expressing their disdain at the fact that my particular race is more likely to be incarcerated? Yes, it's true that certain ethnicities are disproportionately represented in prison populations, namely blacks in America and indigenous or Middle Eastern people here in Australia. But you're committing the cardinal sin of statistics if you push the narrative that insert race is more likely to be incarcerated. Correlation does not equal causation. There is one substantial causal factor as to whether you will be incarcerated and you are in control of it. Do you commit crime? It's that simple. Are there instances of horrific police malfeasance that should be atoned for? Yes, but suggesting that because of your race you are likely to be incarcerated is a grossly disempowering narrative. Circumstances and history influence your environment, but your environment need not be deterministic. This is a defeatist, infantilizing, and emotionally abusive narrative to tell people of color. It ignores the majority of people of color who grow up poor with intergenerational trauma and don't commit crime. Is it harder for them? Likely yes. But to suggest that crime is only an issue of structural racism and the police are a neo-fascist vanguard of oppression is obscene. In Australia, if, as suggested, police do unfairly target Aboriginals and Arabs, I could easily pass for either of those ethnicities, so believe me, I'd be vociferously against the pig dogs if those statistics bore out. But upon deeper inspection, they don't. There are countless factors at play. In fact, if there ever was a time to check your privilege, it's if you are expressing a sentiment like the police are fascists. You've clearly never experienced crime. For those who have, being politically correct is not a priority. Safety is. None of this is to say the police are perfect and there isn't evidence of a toxic culture among them. But as powerful as those viral stories of lived experience may be, the statistics just don't line up with the narrative they engender. And believe me, the culture among gangs is far worse than any police culture in the West. Which brings me to the next chapter. Chapter 4. Culture. I can see how for many, observing the unequal outcomes between ethnic groups and taking history into account leads to the most widely proclaimed conclusion, that society is structured in a way to maintain the power of white people. Because if that's not the case, the only other seemingly logical conclusion is that certain groups are inherently inferior. Neither of these are correct. It goes without saying, no one is inherently inferior due to their genetics. However, certain cultures are maladaptive. I tend to see culture as completely separate from race and I hope society can get to that point one day. I understand it's often murky distinguishing cultural criticism from racism, but to truly be an individual and achieve self-actualization, one should think critically about their culture. I mean, Progressives think very critically about Western culture, but assume where there are inequities, there must be oppression. 
Again, like with critical race theory, this is a valid concern and a voice at the table, but it need not be sacrosanct. The way I like to see culture is as the personality of a given ethnic, national, or tribal group. Culture evolves as a way to adapt to a given environment. In the same way, personality can form in response to an environment. If you experience trauma, you can develop defense mechanisms to cope with that trauma, such as an insecure attachment style, addictions, inability to trust others, or at the extreme end of the scale, psychopathy or Machiavellianism. Similarly, if a group experiences trauma, they can develop a culture to cope with that trauma. That culture could be militarism, anti-intellectualism, or addictions on a mass scale. Now, if an individual has developed a maladaptive personality in response to trauma, anyone close to them or any psychologist worth their weight in salt knows the best thing to do is to challenge those habits, behaviors, and facets of their identity. That doesn't mean whatever trauma they experienced didn't happen. It's not invalidating the experience itself, but we can all agree that someone who was abused and becomes an alcoholic should still be told their alcoholism isn't good for them. As anyone who knows people who have dealt with addiction or have self-sabotaging personality traits, it's very hard to challenge them on it. It's almost always met with defensiveness, aggression, or avoidance. You can see where I'm going with this. If a culture develops in the wake of abuse and trauma, that doesn't mean it's a culture worth maintaining. And critiquing that culture does not mean that trauma and abuse did not happen. In fact, Thomas Sowell in his collection of essays, Black Rednecks and White Liberals, details how Africans brought to America through the slave trade were denied the ability to maintain their native African cultures and were thus subsumed into the poor white cultures of the American South. Cultures stemming mostly from immigrants of the Scottish Highlands and modern day Ireland. These were more often than not tribal, less educated, sexually impulsive people. So his argument is, ironically enough, the culture holding back black America is in fact a white culture that they had no choice but to adopt and make their own. Those damn Celts. The sacred word here in Australia is multiculturalism. And though I think it's important we go through a phase of multiculturalism in response to what was the historical racism of Australia, the issue comes when all cultures are deemed sacred. Culture should be respected, but not above criticism. To me, this is empowering for individuals to let go of harmful cultural practices and essentially have a buffet of potential norms or values they may integrate into their personal life. The majority of people have intertwined culture so deeply into their sense of identity, it has become an integral part of them, like their race, and thus it's treated much as the same when it's criticized. Questioning or satirizing one's culture can feel like one is being subjected to racism, but I would compel all watching this video to think about that. A growing vanguard of managerial elites essentially acting as the neo-priest class of the West persistently decried differences in outcomes among ethnic groups and always weaponize these differences as a way to force their ideology down everyone's throat. But it's not that simple. As I've done in this video essay, let's look at this on an individual level. Two children, parents with the same income, both grow up in the same neighborhood. Child A plays football four hours a day, every day after school. Child B studies mathematics four hours a day, every day after school. No one would have an issue suggesting child B is more likely to do well academically and child A to do well athletically. However, as soon as you extrapolate this out into ethnic groups, ethnic group one has a culture that on average puts more emphasis on academic performance and ethnic group two puts more emphasis on creativity and spirituality. Well, it's no different. Why wouldn't we assume ethnic group A would be more likely to excel academically? We get uneasy about it because we get into potentially racist territory but in this hypothetical, the ethnicity of those groups had nothing to do with their predicted outcomes. It was the repetitive behaviors and norms practiced through their childhood. There's nothing genetic about that. It is more empowering to say that though you may not be entirely in control of you or your child's outcomes, there are clear behaviors you can emulate and instill what will give you or them a better chance of success in the current system. Erasing or adjusting a culture does not erase one's race. That's a bizarre argument to make. 
Culture is a set of behaviors, norms, and values that unite a group. But the beauty of Western society today for all its flaws is that if you're willing to forego the acceptance of a few insecure members of the extended family, you can choose your culture. That is empowering. In fact, Sol in his second essay talks about middlemen minorities like Jews, Germans, the Lebanese, or the Chinese. The diaspora of these ethnicities almost always outperform native peoples economically and academically. This is also the case with Indians, Nigerians, Kenyans. Certain immigrant groups do outperform others. Sol even notes how West Indian immigrants in New York, who were also descended from slaves, routinely outperformed African Americans on economic and educational metrics. When you control for race, the more you tend to look into it, race plays much less of a role than what is assumed in various outcomes. It makes people uncomfortable, but culture plays a role in the outcomes of various groups. My argument though is that this is empowering for individuals as they can shape their destiny if, as a society, we move towards culture being respected but not sacred nor above critique. As culture is the software, malleable and forever unfinished, while race is the hardware. Chapter 5. What do we do? This is all valuable information, but what do we actually do? No one wants to see a particular racial makeup of the downtrodden, much less anyone living in abject poverty and disillusionment. Well, firstly, those who are the rose activist types need to allow the space for differences in opinion without responding with the tired knee-jerk reaction that those differences are tantamount to turning a blind eye to oppression. If we are making works of anti-racism and critical race theory, required reading for adolescents and HR departments, that should be accompanied with writers like Sol and McWhorter. There needs to be a clear description of the facts of history separate from the multitude of ideologies concerned with the interpretation of those facts and how to deal with them moving forward. We need to fill the deep spiritual void felt by swaths of secularized youth who no longer have religion, a national identity, a familial identity, barely even a career identity, and are thus attracted to pseudo-spiritual ideologies. Progressive culture needs to look further than just abolishing previous social structures and must be in equal parts concerned with how to replace them adequately with new social institutions that implement our current ethics of egalitarianism. People should spend no more than one hour on social media, if that. Unless, of course, you're watching these videos or the Sex Sales podcast. Check us out. Social media, like any media, is interested in maintaining your attention and is subtly keeping you outraged by emphasizing, exaggerating, and even downright lying to you about emotionally laden issues. Allowing the space for nuance in issues of race and activism. Moving away from, excuse the term, but black and white mentality that is rife in any discussion about race. I know it will be, but I don't intend for this video to be some anti-woke polemic. I wanted to be a piece in favor of nuance and diversity of opinion. Many of critical race theory's observations are accurate. People of color have to think about race more. You should take into account history and society's norms when dealing with this issue. Saying we should stop talking about race altogether is reductive, but rosé activism and its adherents need to stop gatekeeping the Overton window of accepted opinion about race and smearing all as having white fragility or internalized racism if they dare step outside of that Overton window. Finally, I know this video is only accessible to a subset of the population. Complex reports and works of literature reach no one compared to a song about lived experience, and people ultimately make emotional decisions. The right or the center, or those who are against what John McWhorter calls the elect, need to get better at making emotional arguments. It's difficult because much of our beliefs stem from our ability to look beyond the emotional, but it serves these ideas to be able to market them emotionally in the culture war. Okay, that was a long and passionate one. I hope you enjoyed it. Insert sex joke. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments.